Welcome to the Innovation Storytellers Podcast. We talk to innovators and disruptors in R&D, product managers, entrepreneurs, and entrepreneurs, innovation thought leaders, and their storytellers who help bring their amazing ideas to life. Now, here's your host, innovation storyteller, CEO, speaker, and coach to the world's top innovation teams, Susan Lindner. everyone. I'm Susan Lindner, your host here at Innovation Storytellers. And for the last 20 years, I've been helping innovators and disruptors to tell their stories. 10 acquisitions, hundreds of innovative products, and countless hockey stick growth charts up and down, um, <laughs> new categories along the way. I wanted to share how great innovations get to market using stories to pave the way. And I'm really, really excited to have the irreverent, the one and only Greg Larkin on our call with me today. Greg is the founder and CEO of Punks and Pinstripes, a very innovative innovation consultancy. I, I would say you are a disruption consultancy, Greg. Is that fair to say? I think it's fair to say. Well, let me give a little bit more background on Greg. Um, so Greg is on a mission to empower entrepreneurs to do their most transformative work everywhere they work, even when it's really hard. Um, he is the author of the international bestseller, This Might Get Me Fired, a book I've read several times because it is smack you in the face innovation. It is not, here's the how-to guide, or here's the lovely Bible around the lean startup, all critical books. It's not your Clay Christensen. It is a, holy crap, this is really what it's like, tales from the front line kind of stuff. Um, he is an international keynote speaker and has built some of the most disruptive innovations of our time. He is the founder of Punks and Pinstripes, which is a global community of entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs and punks who support and empower each other to get shit done. Um, in 2006, Greg was the first person to publicly predict the subprime financial crisis, and that prediction propelled him and his startup, InnoVest, to an $18 million acquisition. As a result, he served as the director of product innovation at Bloomberg, that little mom and pop shop, that little financial services organization there. I think, I think that founder guy ran for a high office somewhere. Never yeah. heard of him. Never heard of him. Mikey. Um, Greg has worked. Oh, with, Mike. Yeah, I know. Him. Oh, that guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, Greg has worked with Google, PwC, Uber, Booz Allen, Hamilton, Sky, and across the Fortune 500 to launch transformative products and empower entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs alike. Greg has lived all over the world, but he is most at home. The land of the egg cream, Brooklyn, New York. Greg, I am so freaking thrilled to have you on this call because um, much like Forrest Gump said, you never know what you're going to get. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. This is what you're going to get, Susan Lindner. It is a pleasure and a joy and a delight, and it makes me feel fuzzy and warm to see your lovely face <laughs> and to talk some truth and... Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. This is, as always, Susan, every time we get together, it can be a little bit, a little bit subversive, a little bit explosive. And I feel like we're both going for that, aren't we? Yeah, I mean, because why are we in innovation if we're not here to shake stuff up? I mean, if we wanted the status quo, we would have worked in businesses. Well, first of all, we wouldn't have been entrepreneurs. Second of all, we wouldn't have worked with disruptive companies as a preference, as a choice. Um, and we are people who fundamentally get bored of doing the same thing over and over again. So it can't be anything else than irreverent. I think that's true. I also was someone who went into the corporate universe with a deeply rooted distrust of authority in general. Mm, that's and the so side. It's a it's a huge punk side, and and also I I I think throughout my life have in in ways that are maybe unhealthy or could seriously backfire. But um, I've always viewed opposition as validation. You know, it's no one's getting pissed off because of the thing I'm doing or saying or writing or building. 
then I'm probably not doing it right. And I don't mean you have to intentionally piss people off. Is that part of the plan from the outset? Or is it just an expectation that it will happen? You, ha as an innovator, you have to be inherently, you have, an, have to have an inherent belief that the system is not working as well as it could. Mm. Right? If you're not fixing anything that's broken, then you're not really fixing anything. And I don't know that you have to necessarily try to piss the system off, but you have to be more devoted to a really important high return on investment impact than you do have to be devoted to status or accolades or being promoted or getting your boss's boss to think, wow, that kid's onto something. You have to be so devoted to the impact you want to see materialize that you're willing to get fired for it. And I, and I think that fun. Say that one more time. You have to be so devoted. Say that again. Yeah. So you have to be so devoted and committed to creating an impact that you're willing to get fired for it. Hmm. And really that is the difference between an entrepreneur and an innovator. An innovator is like, I'm going to push this until the point where I'm about to get in real trouble. An entrepreneur is like, I'm going to push this way past that point. I hope I piss some people off. And it's a very different thing. And a disruptor is like, F it. Let's go break shit. Is that right? Uh, sort of. I think a disruptor is, um, so I think a disruptor is a bigger umbrella that encompasses both entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs. Um, and it's not just breaking things because of like nihilism or something, but it's breaking things for the purpose of displacing an incumbent solution that shouldn't be there. It doesn't deserve to be in charge anymore and serving the market better, faster, smarter. So how did you get into this innovation business to begin with? Uh, by accident. Um, I mean, how far back you want me to go? Like, so where was the switch from like, let's do things normal to let's do things not normal? I think I, I think I first realized that so I've never done anything normal, right? Like I've always been someone who played high school football, but also was like going to Parsons School of Design and also was really into punk music. And, you know, I never, I grew up not fitting in with any crowd, but also being able to roll with every crowd. Um, and I didn't like being identifiable. I never liked it when someone could say, that's Greg, he's a blank. <laughs> you know, that always was me like, well, for me, that always felt throughout my life. Like, why are you trying to compartmentalize me? Like, I don't fit in that box. Mm. Um, and it always bristled when someone tried to squeeze me into a box that I didn't belong in. Um, I, I would say the, the, the fundamental foundational event of, of this path was when I first, uh, when I first predicted that the housing market was going to collapse in 2006 and the house council of Lehman brothers, of Bear Stearns, of every bank on wall street was like, we're, we're going to sue you. You can't say that. That's, that's slander. That's libel. And, and that's how dare you, you punk. Um, and my CEO of my startup Innovest at the time was like, fuck those guys, fuck them in their fucking face. They want to make this go public that they're going to like put pressure on us and fuck them in their fucking ear. Like we're going to put, take out a full page ad on the back pages of the wall street journal and the financial times publishing our report. And only when we've purchased that ad, are we then going to call them and be like, Hey, you still want to sue us asshole. <laughs> and, and that's how we played it. And they immediately were like, I'm sorry, I think you misunderstood us. This is a long drawn out process. He's like either back the fuck down or the ad goes out. Do we have a promise that the ad that you're going to back down? Yes, we do. 
And I love that. I love that so much. I think for most 27 year olds who are just like in their first startup job, that would be like, um, are you sure you want to be in this line of work? This is not for the faint of heart. This is definitely swimming with some sharks. Um, and how amazing you know, that your boss had your back, right? Well, my boss had my back. Not only did he have my back, the report itself wound up being seminal, really. Like it was the first, when people, when the shit really started to hit the fan with Lehman Brothers and the financial crisis of 2008, and people were looking for somebody who saw it coming, they found me. And it was the most unexpected of places to find the person that called it. Hmm. Right. I'd never worked in Wall Street before. InnoVest was a pretty small name, um, but it was only, you know, instead of failing because most of our clients were falling apart because of the crisis, we got acquired. Um, and so I think very early on, I, I don't know that I could have articulated at the time that what I'm articulating now, which is that uh, opposition is validation. I think I've come to learn that, but that was the first moment where I experienced opposition. And if I now, you know, whatever, 14 years after the fact, I look back at my career since then, and I think of the highlights, all of them had some kind of moment of extreme opposition that, yes, it was scary, but it was necessary, it was right. People should have been pissed off. The old guard absolutely should have been displaced. Um, and I think that that theme is such a recurring and important theme. And, and I'm, I, I find myself to this day when I work with the companies I work with, I'm constantly telling them people aren't pissed off enough. Like I think I think you're letting people who should not get off the hook you're letting them off the hook. You're letting them believe they're doing it right. And it's an important choice to make. And, and that's often why they're hiring me to come in in the first place, which is like, build what's necessary. Uh, don't, don't build what looks sexy or acts sexy. Uh, we have outcomes that we have to achieve and cannot achieve if we've already, or we do what we've always done. Yeah. And, um, and it's, that also implies, correct me if I'm wrong, but it also implies a dismantling of what is not working. Mm -hmm. If we must do what works, then we must dismantle what does not. Ye to a point, uh, sort of. Hmm. Um, I would have never predicted this six years ago, but... I do a lot of work with some big government contractors and like Booz Allen Hamilton was a client for a long time. Um, you cannot disrupt, you cannot throw the baby out with the bathwater. Just because it is old, it does not mean it is bad. Um, in the same way where I'm telling I tell companies like you should embrace the punk ethos of innovation. Being punk does not mean being an asshole, <laughs> right? There's a huge difference. Um, and so I, I think that you're creating autonomy and safety within an organization like that. So they're not misrepresenting optimization on a legacy business as innovation or entrepreneurship. They cannot let themselves off the hook on that front. Uh -huh. But so if it's not that, then are you creating space to launch new ventures and launch like 12 new ventures, build a portfolio of new ventures and give it permission so that 10 out of 12 fail, but the two that succeed mean that the portfolio as a, lot, as a whole has a 20x return on investment by year three. You know, that's, that's really different than contenting your, to yourself to say, you know, we have a great innovation program because in our legacy business, we had a little bit of AI. 
we've got some machine learning that happens. We have an agile, we're agile. Ooh, sexy. <laughs> And I see that mistake made all the time. You know, you hired someone to run a post-it party because they're a design thinking consultant and suddenly you're a fucking innovator. Like, no, you, you, you use the same budget that you use to like pay for the office Christmas party. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, don't blow sunshine up your own ass. You're not fucking Tesla all of a sudden. Right. And because you got a post-it party, I've never <laughs> Expressive before, but that's so right on. I, I think you probably incorporate in your talks. I, know, I, I give a whole talk on innovation theater, and um, which is called "What's the story you're telling yourself about your innovation program?" Um, <laughs> which is not what storytelling should be about. It's like if you're incorporating the following elements into your story around innovation, you are lying to yourself that you are doing it. It starts off often with a very expensive coffee machine, some very expensive beanbag chairs and fine wall art. Um, and like you said, post-it parties um, and lots of, lots of lean. Or my a favorite, lot of lean. Uh, my favorite is um, the open innovation contests where you have lots of employees giving their really best thinking to solving really entrenched problems in a company. And then they're never heard from again. Like just goes into the giant suggestion box that is a flushable toilet. It is in the porta potty of responses. Well, so I'm I'm so I'm really glad you brought this up because what's starting to happen, and I don't think the world is paying enough attention to it. Like GE, for example, GE who hired Beth Comstock and hired Eric Reese as if I and Beth was part of GE from before. Like their stock is down 73% and they were held up as the poster child of innovation. They threw the biggest post-it party of them all. You know, and I don't think every time I've spoken to anyone who is an alumnus of GE innovation, anything, be it corporate venture capital, be it GE ventures, be it anything, I'm like, can you please point me to a stream of revenue that you built that was disruptive, that was could have gone head to head with any of the other big startups that were competing in your space? Show me something that you built or that you or show me a legacy product that you turned around. Anything. It's like, no, but we all have like Six Sigma black belts. I'm like, who the fuck cares? Show me the money. Tell me why Warren Buffett would be in the same elevator as you, who's someone who's totally innovation agnostic, and be like, you may be innovation agnostic, but I think you're going to be very happy about some of the things we've built and how they have ad added value to our, our stock, to our corporate performance. Yeah. Um, and I, and, I, and I think there's this horrible stigma that has circulated around innovation land, largely because of like the prevalence of design thinking is that if you, if you put too much pressure on an innovation team to deliver ROI, then you will smother the innovation. And, and I, I think we're actually living, I think that's wrong, first of all. I think yeah. innovation uh, only works when there's a real consequence associated with it not working. And that's not to say that you should not have permission to fail on a specific product, but at the portfolio level, you have to put points on the board. You have to be able to show a sharp financial departure from the way your company performed in the past based on what you're building that's new. So that's really fascinating. Um, so I was, you know, when I look back, there's a, there's a brand new book out by a reporter from the Wall Street Journal um, about GE and its innovation um, culture um, called Lights Out, Pride, Delusion, and the Fall of GE. And- um, I started to read it. Yeah, and um, fascinating, right? Because, um, you know, it was Jack Welsh was the bellwether of, and GE became the bellwether of the stock market in the midst of the internet boom. And they were building a platform called Predix and it was going to be, you know, the greatest digital industrial platform that every partner, every customer, every supplier 
could use to bring this entire GE ecosystem to life. And they put more money in that than anything else, I think, in the history of GE, if you can imagine, in one single innovation product. Um, teams and teams of teams of people who couldn't get the spec straight, couldn't get the conversation right. Um, and you know that time from Jack Welsh under his leadership, which was all about acquisition, acquisition, acquisition. Sure. Um, it's the least innovative time in the history of GE, but a time when the stock was through the roof because they thought these acquisitions were brilliant and a time where if you didn't perform to the ROI level that you were set out to make, you were fired, right? If you were in the bottom 10%, you were gone. You were fired, the end. And then came this time with Jack, you know, of um, Immelt of building Predix and it was gonna be the greatest thing since sliced bread. And that was the story that was being told and yet nobody can make it work. Nobody could get it to work. And so to your point about like, where's the balance between, you know, I think about the founder, right? One of the greatest innovators of all time, um, Edison, 10,000 tries at the light bulb. What happens, Greg, when you come in at, at try number 7,426 and you're not there yet? Like, how do you know when it's time to pull the plug if you're not getting points on the board? You know, if you're, sure. if you're on your way, <laughs> but you have to stop halfway through. If you're making the acquisitions and the stock market's through the roof, but you haven't innovated a single thing in the 25 years you've been in business, you've been the CEO of the company. Like, it's so, this innovation stuff is not easy. Right. I mean, how so there's a couple of things. Okay. What you, you're talking, there's like just so many layers to, to the GE Sorry story. About that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so one one of the things that I, I I I think has to be emphasized and is not enough is that um, I, I'm not speaking out of turn here. Jeff Immelt was not a nice guy to work for. Ah. Uh. You know, he had a volcanic temper. Uh, he was proud of his volcanic temper. He liked people to be afraid of him. Mm. And I don't think you can separate the fear factor of a, of a fear-based innovation culture where in an environment like that, anyone who's going into a demo with, 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 with Jeff had to, knew they had to, prove it was working and prove they were perfect. They were, it was not acceptable for you to go into a meeting with Jeff Immelt and say, we're struggling. It's not easy right now. And so I, I think the extent to which high ROI also has to be matched with a culture of trust and a culture of safety and an acknowledgement that it might be the 10,000th time that's the winner. You, you do have permission to fail. Mm -hmm. We're not, the failure of this project doesn't make you a failure. And that we, I, as the CEO, have to create a governance structure to optimize the, your performance. It is a non-negotiable. Um, and I think that is one of the biggest challenges of enterprise innovation. You take a company which has a legacy of baby boomer command and control CEOs. And in a company like GE, you cannot, there's no company that is more baby boomer command and control than that. I work a lot in financial services. You know, I think people have said that Wall Street is fueled by greed. That is not true. It is fueled by men who are terrified of their own vulnerability. That's very Brene Brown of you. Okay, maybe. I don't know her that well, but that's what it is, right? It is considered failure to express weakness and vulnerability on Wall Street. And as an entrepreneur in an organization where that is the, pre that the, the prevailing cultural paradigm to go in and say, the idea is right, but we're stuck. We're struggling. We need help. 
and, and we as an organization are not doing enough to create an environment where this type of entrepreneurship can thrive. Mm. Um, that's an essential thing for someone to feel comfortable saying in any entrepreneurial environment and the extent to which the prevailing cultural paradigm extinguishes that and replaces it with, we don't have time for survivors here. We want superheroes here. Um, it's like this weird toxic masculinity superhero, superhero culture and it does more. And, and I think right now we're going through a, a, a time when I personally believe uh, and I'm writing my next book about it right now, but I actually think that cultural paradigm is going to be the thing which means that GE is just the canary in the coal mine. The 68% decline in GE stock over the past five years, um, that is not an anomaly. Mm. That, that is the first shoe to drop of something which I believe will be the next great disruption storm because uh, Commercial banks and investment banks have not yet been disrupted, not like Amazon disrupted retail. Mm. And there is absolutely no way you can operate with that degree of rigid cultural hierarchy in an organization in the midst of the disruption economy and emerge unscathed. And the extent to which every entrepreneur on Wall Street didn't simply over the past 10 years has not just said, all right, I'm going to go from Goldman Sachs and I'm going to move over to Morgan Stanley and hope that I can carve out a little bit more creative autonomy while I'm at Morgan Stanley. No, they're all leaving. They are all launching startups. And many of those startups are growing to a place where they can actually start stealing business from their former employers. Um, no one's paying attention to that disruption diaspora. Mm. And um, and I'll say one other thing with regards to to, to um, Jeff Immel <clears throat> or GE rather. There is um, you have to have a portfolio reallocation strategy in a company. What do you do if in six weeks you don't achieve your milestones? You, and, and, and if you have 12 things on the go, maybe they're all aligned to whatever it was that that, what, what, what was it? Predict, predictix? Predict. Mm -hmm. Right. So whatever the goal of that was is not necessarily a goal you should abandon. But if you have 12 different ventures competing to get there or solving a different piece of it, um, you have to have a six week, a six month milestone of what they should have accomplished. And you have to have a process for saying, okay, if these outcomes were not delivered, then this team, this talent, this technology, this capital, it's going to be redeployed. Now, maybe they go back to the start and they start all over again. We have to but you should, but you, you, you should not lock yourself into a position where suddenly you're trying to beat a dead horse. No, it's a failed experiment. It happens. It should happen. And it should happen. It should happen. That's right. And, and, and in a com so you have the, that kind of experimentation in a culture which is command and control and fear-based. Mm. And what you wind up happening is that this huge pool of capital, of, 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 of financial debt, of technical debt, of talent deficit, of people who are not performing at their best because they're so afraid, and no one has the balls. No, let me rephrase that. No one has the ovarian or testicular <laughs> fortitude. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Welcome. I'm trying to wean <laughs> myself off of balls. <laughs> Aren't we all? Aren't we all? Aren't we all? <laughs> um, no one has the uh, audacity to right. say, uh, yeah, you know what? Like, we don't need to throw good money after bad. Um, I, I just, I, I've seen that pattern repeated in almost every financial services management consulting firm I've ever worked for. Wow. And, um, and the reason they call me in to work for them 
is because I, I, I say it for what it is. I'm not kissing anybody's ass. The fact that I'm, as, as an outsider, what I'm able to say uh, as an outsider who's speaking to the people on the inside, no one on the inside has the mandate to stand up and say that out loud. And, and that's the hardest part for the entrepreneur, right? Is, I mean, one of the things that, that your books makes, your book makes explicitly clear is if you're not willing to lose your job for this, if you're not willing to die on this hill effectively for this innovation, um, then um, you're not really in it to win it, right? Because effectively it takes someone who's willing to stand up, who's willing to, to um, speak their piece in order for an innovation really to reach its final destination, right? To reach the finish line. Yeah. Um, Greg, talk a little bit about um, that, you know, what's really motivating the innovation? Number one, is it the desire to be innovative, to have a competitive advantage, to get more revenue on the books? Like in your experience, you know, working on the inside, PwC, Bloomberg, Google, et cetera, what's the number one driving force? Is it the cash? Is it, is it prestige? Is it a competitive advantage? What is it? Is it different everywhere? I'll, I'll tell you the ideal scenario. Um, the ideal scenario is we just lost our biggest account to a startup and it's been our biggest account for 30 years, right? That's, like that's the, that's the engagement you like most. I love those. Love when them. someone, when someone brings me in and they're like, we thought we were doing a good job of innovating and the market just told us that we're not. Oof. And we've, settled into this complacency that we're doing this right. And yet people that are smaller than us and hungrier than us and faster than us are now landing some really serious punches that are forcing us to have some very uncomfortable conversations on our quarterly earnings call with Wall Street. Can you please help? So um, by Robinhood, right? These are on the financial services side. These are companies that are just making Wall Street quake. Yeah, I would say so. Uh -huh. And then uh, and then there's, so let's call that like active disruption. If someone calls me up when, when they're getting disrupted and it's starting to feel that way. They can feel the pain, um, yeah. We're gonna have a real conversation, right? They're not calling me in to kiss their ass. They're not mm -hmm. calling me in to throw a posted party. They're, 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 they're calling me in because, um, they're really worried about what they're gonna, the, the answers that they're gonna have to provide next quarter when they have to report their earnings. And, they're, and, and the market is asking them, hey, give us a reason to fall back in love with you guys because you haven't shown us what we need. Um, I think it's a very simple scenario, right? Uh, investors and customers are two very different groups, but they have one thing in common, which is they do not like spending money on stupid shit. <laughs> <laughs> right it, it, it's just simple it's fucking simple susan <laughs> right like investors and customers don't like spending money on stupid shit and they do not care if you are on the brink of going from being a senior vice president to an executive director that might be what the hr person told you and your boss told you no one in their right fucking mind cares about that mm -hmm. and when a company has to recognize that their entire culture and values and operating systems and processes and products portfolio is totally misaligned with what customers and investors want from them. And so much, so it's so suboptimal compared to the other options on the table for investors and customers. When they have that realization, uh, they're starting from they're starting to innovate from a place of humility. They're also innovating with urgency. They have very little time to get that right. Humility and urgency form a very good value based um, <laughs> foundation for actually getting stuff done. Yes, and and there and it's there's a very high probability that they will wind up looking like Sears or J C Penney if, if they. they if the if the 
clients in the market are starting to defect already, the, the, the odds of success in the disruption economy in which we currently live are very small. You have a very narrow window of time to get it right and to uh, basically have a stagnation ectomy. In order to move it forward. So what about politics, Greg? What about you know those, because it takes innovation teams to make stuff happen. We, on this show, we always talk about the resources, the runway, the time frame, um, and the recognition within an organization to actually get stuff done. So where does the politics really hinder innovation from overcoming inertia, from actually moving and getting through that human caterpillar of an organization, human centipede of an organization? <laughs> Well, so I, I think one of the biggest challenges for the entrepreneur is as follows. Um, the norms of corporate hierarchy are totally incompatible with the requirements of disruption. The norms of corporate hierarchy are inadequate for the- Incompatible this. with- incompatible. with with innovation. With innovation. Because I'll tell you something, in the same way that customers, investors, and investors don't spend want to spend money on stupid shit, what corporate hierarchy forces you to do is you become consumed with the fact that Andrea made a bigger bonus than you, that John got promoted ahead of you. That's the thing that you go home and you sleep on. That's the thing that festers. Those little political digs, you, you might go start at, in the game thinking, I'll never let that get to me, but over time it does. That's what you marinate in. It's what you marinate in, and eventually the insidious thing about it is that it's how you start defining yourself. And eventually you start to forget about the customers and investors. You start to feel completely separated and detached from them. Hmm. And... And at that point, you're, when that is the, the prevailing norm, in my view, disruption is inevitable. It might not be this year, but... It's coming for you. 100%. Yeah. We have and I think, and I, I think, I don't know, there's a guy, um, he, hasn't, I mean, he hasn't given me his permit, permission to use his name, although I know he would love for me to talk to him. So I'm just, I'm going to call him Sid. Um, <laughs> and, and Sid has uh, worked at the upper reaches of many of the biggest banks on Wall Street and investment banks, which is a fundamentally different innovation landscape than a direct-to-consumer bank. Um, the direct-to-consumer banking I believe that is a market which has already been disrupted and transformed, but it's a much smaller slice of the pie than investment banking. Investment banking, you're dealing with billions of dollars a day. Not Forget about billions of dollars a, a quarter or a tel, total el, a, a addressable market of, of, of billions. No, you're dealing with like billions of dollars of transactions every day. And... Sid has always, in every one of these organizations, his prevailing attitude is, I don't give a shit about what my status is, right? I am the most creative person here. If you want me to go and disrupt you from the outside, do it. Fire me now. Otherwise, don't pull rank on me. Don't feed me a line of bullshit. If you would be more comfortable with me disrupting you than having an opportunity to work with me inside of the four walls of this organization, then let's get to work. But if you're going to pull that shit, then let me know so I can move on with my life. It makes him the most powerful guy in every company he's ever worked in. Mm. And, and, and I'm not going to name those names, but it, they are the biggest Wall Street banks in the world. And, so, and I, I think there is absolutely a prevailing political paradigm in every organization, which is, let me first size you up in the hierarchy. Let me first figure out your political acumen. Let me first figure out whether we can form a political alliance that is expedient. 
and then maybe start working together. And it's it, for many people who are on the inside, it's not even conscious that they're doing that. And there's enormous political capital that someone who says, I see what you're doing in your head while we're talking right now. Don't fucking pull that shit with me. It's not how I'm playing the game. This is how I'm playing the game. And if you're not prepared to do that, because I am opting out of that system. If you're not prepared to do that, and I can't get points on the board, and you want to live with the consequences of having an untransformed business, let me know, because I'm in the business of putting points on the board. I'm absolutely put, driving impact. And if you are okay with what I, how I operate, then we can do incredible things together. We can form an alliance of punks and pinstripes unlike anything the world has ever seen. But sleep on it, because if you're not prepared to do that with me, uh, I'll start making alternative plans. So and there's, there's an incredible untapped power that that person has. They can get access to anyone in the room, anyone. Um, and I just, uh, please fire me is a statement that people should say a lot more. So this, um, and is that, Greg, would that be your clarion call to entrepreneurs, um, wherever they may be, that says, Captain, my captain, you stand on your desk and you say, take my word, let's do this, or fire me already? I think that's, I'm not necessarily saying they need to say that. I am saying that they need to understand that, that if they have that power, they have to recognize that they have that power. Uh-huh. Gotcha. Um, I don't think they have to be abrasive with it. I don't think they have to be obnoxious about it. I don't think they have to call in favors that, are owed, that aren't owed to them. There's a way to do this quite tactfully, and you're, there's a way to do this where you're lifting all boats and it's clear to everyone that that's what you're doing. Yeah. You're going um, to get rid of it all, not just to, to screw it all. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but when you start to recognize, this is what I, I fundamentally believe, that if you are an entrepreneur and you do have the ability to move fast in a company that's slow, and you do have the ability to build something that can go head to head with any startup that's out there in terms of speed, in terms of value, in terms of ROI, and you happen to work on the inside of an organization that's really big and really risk averse, but you have that ability, own that because it makes you the most powerful person in the room, regardless of your rank. Hmm. And I've seen so many entrepreneurs who have that ability but have it beaten into them that you do not rock the boat. You do not, you do not disrupt the, the hierarchy here. And eventually it atrophies. And I think that's one of the worst, most horrific like corporate culture tragedies I've observed throughout my life. And the companies themselves leave that money on the table. Forget about like culturally, it's not nice to make someone hate their job. I'm not even talking about that. Mm. I, I, I've seen hundreds of billions of dollars of great products that had product market fit die and you read the autopsy and it's politics. It has nothing to do with technical inability to thrive. It has nothing to do with, we couldn't really get it to gain traction in the market. Users didn't like it. It didn't have pre-orders. No, it's just Jim who went golfing with John for the past 30 fucking years, didn't like you. So he killed it. And you know, Deutsche Bank is another company you can put in the same bucket as GE, right? Like, that's how Deutsche Bank works. And they, the S&P 500 has gone up 65% over the past five years. Deutsche Bank has gone down by 65%. Oof. So I, I think this, this idea that you as an entrepreneur need to grovel and beg is so fucking stupid because if you have that power and you have that ability, the cost of not them not taking you seriously or them not 
being able to honor that power and make use of and generate a return on that human capital investment is you wind up like GE, you wind up like Deutsche Bank, you do slide 65%, you do have some very uncomfortable financial uh, results that you now suddenly have to defend. So, I mean, this is, um, I think you and I are committed to one, one unerring principle, which is, I will not let your innovation fail. Like if it's, if it is, um, what it can be, if it does what you say it can do, um, let's get that thing to the finish line. Um, and your end is actually developing that product and overseeing that process, right? All the way from idea to market, to product market fit. And then hopefully to the main, out into the free ocean, right? Out into the open ocean where it sinks and swims on, on the whims of customers and the desires of customers. My side of the coin is actually fostering that motion with story that that people can gravitate and understand. I mean, I don't know if you have this experience, Greg, internally at some of the companies that you work with. I work with a lot of technical leaders who start off every presentation with a chemical formula, with a biological equation, with a mathematical principle or a piece of code that mm -hmm. is intelligible to non-technical people. You know, I've spent a lifetime at the bench creating amazing things um, or at a screen or in a lab. And yet um, from a communication standpoint, it dies because people can't see the potential of this beautiful thing. How many times do you find that the story doesn't match the opportunity of what this product or service or business model change or pricing model change, right? It doesn't have to be a thing, um, has to hold. How often does that story, is, if it's not there for the innovation you're working on, does the innovation die? <sighs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough question. Um, I think there's sort of two directions of story and both of and and, I, and, I, and sometimes no one tells any story and other times they only tell one direction of it um, and it goes back to customers and it goes back to investors if someone tells a story if the people who are the cios and the ctos tell a story it's very often a customer centric story mm -hmm. imagine a world where someone can call a Get taxi from a touch of a button on their phone, you know. Um, and so I, I do find that very often when I am working with my customers, I always say, number one, don't ever pitch an uh, idea, only pitch an outcome. That's the first and second rule. That outcome has to be a user outcome. When you leave that on the table, it, it often will die on the vine. It might work very well, but if no one understands why it's working and how it might be impactful because it's working, they don't have a good reason to take a risk investing in it and defending it. Mm. Having said that, you have to be able to explain why that customer and the fact that you're serving that customer, serving that market segment better and, and smarter than they've been served before is something that investors should be happy about. How is that going to improve earnings per share? How is that going to improve return on equity? How are your gross profit margins going to shrink or contract? Every product that works either saves money or grows revenue, explain how. And, and, and say it in language that you understand that you can explain to your seven, seventh grader. Save and grows revenue, yeah. That's it. It's either, if you're saving money, you're adding, you're adding dollars to the profit margin. And if you're growing revenue, then you're growing revenue. And you might want to tell a story about how it's growing brand equity or something, but there's, I'm sure 
Facebook and Google would have lo lovely metrics to share with you and net promoter score and all that jazz. Um, but I, I, I feel like the directionality of storytelling is so often user centric and people are like, I understand that users are happy. Thank you for sharing that with me. I'm about to have a call with people who represent 25% of our, who own 25% of our market capitalization. That is a pool of money that is greater than the economy of Latin America. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck am I going to tell them about the thing you're building? Right. Um, and I find that innovation teams don't have a good answer to that almost ever. Hmm. They don't have a good elevator pitch for that. They, they don't have a good test of if you find yourself in an elevator with George Soros, what are you going to say when he asks you, why the fuck should I be happy about the fact that you're spending my money? Mm. Um, and I also think that a lot of entrepreneurs have a really good answer for that. They're sitting on products and they're sitting on growth rates where if they just spent a little bit of time massaging that, they would have an incredible answer to that. And when they leave that money on the table, when they leave that story on the table, it just, it doesn't, they're just, they're leaving hundreds of millions of dollars on the table. That is enormous political capital. And, and they don't just, make that connection, right? They're not even seeing it for themselves. I, I mean, you know, so much of, I think what I see is that most innovators have not had the opportunity. Well, first of all, they've been told that telling a value-based story, which is what you're, what you're talking about, um, is, um, is unworthy of the science that has driven the innovation that got you here. Um, it is often filled with fluff and marketing. Uh, it is filled with projections that are unsubstantiated. Um, and it is it calls the science into question when you force it into an economic equation, even though we all know that we live in business. So the desire to fall or the accident is falling in love with one's product versus the problem that one solves and the economic underpinnings of the problem that we are solving, right? That's, that's the, that's the misstep of saying, I'm so in love with this thing I built that I've forgotten what is the benefit of this thing I've built. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, it's, you're not in most situations, the people who are innovating are not doing it inside of like Xerox park research lab, you know, where you have an enormous amount of time and an enormous amount of runway just not. And, and some companies have really robust um, protections for their R&D and they're, they protect it with the, every fiber of their being to grant some autonomy. Even in those environments, you still have to be thinking of your product like it's a venture and, and that you have a bunch of investors, which any startup has to do, even though there's an expectation that it won't work Every, you're still going to have meetings with your VC and your VC is going to have to think about optionality at every one of those meetings. You know, are you ready for a new round? Do you deserve another round? Mm. Have we seen the results? Are we better off putting you, like just shutting you down now and instead of sinking more money into this? You know, there's, there's just smart decisions about reallocating capital and It's not beneath you as an entrepreneur to be thinking about that. It's essential that you be thinking about that. And I'll tell you something else, Susan Lindner. <laughs> <laughs> the entrepreneur who goes into that meeting and says, if I was in your shoes, I would not reinvest right now. I'm looking at the math, I'm looking at the results. If the tables were turned and I'm sitting in your chair, I do not think I would invest further in this business. If you, 
if you do want to invest further in this business, we'll take it all the way to zero if that's what it takes. We hopefully will turn it around. We're going to do everything we can. This is not us giving up. But if you decide that we should give up and you want to reallocate the capital, I think I would reach that same conclusion. That's not weakness. That is not abdication of your responsibilities as a, a venture owner. That is not your ab an abdication of your responsibilities as an entrepreneur. Uh, no, it shows that you're a steward of capital inside of an organization that needs to be smart about where it allocates capital. And this is the humility factor that you're talking about too. A hundred percent. It's the humility factor. That's not, no one's going to say, get the fuck out of my office. How dare you? It's going to be the first honest thing they've ever heard in their freaking life. Mm -hmm. um, because no one goes into those meetings being honest about invalidation. Mm -hmm. And it's really empowering when you are. It shows that you're not full of shit and it puts everyone else, by the way, who does go into those meetings, putting lipstick on the pig of invalidation. Um, suddenly you're the bigger person than everyone else. Mm. Uh, it gives you integrity points and authenticity points that translates into political capital. You know, it's funny, I was having um, one of my guests on the show was the chief innovation officer at Corning Glass. And um, we were discussing, you know, I don't know when to hold them and know when to fold them. And um, we recently started working on pharmaceutical grade glass. Um, well, they have worked in this field for a while, but when you work for a company that has 169 year long history, um, they're digging out products that were shelved in the 1930s. And now finding, they said, you know what, we don't have any use for this right now. It's really interesting, but it's not going anywhere. And um, are now repurposing those experiments um, in 2020. So, you know, a full 90 years later, um, they are drawing on innovations that came about in the 1930s and using those again. They also have an ethos there that says, you know, disruption will happen from within before it happens from without. And the ethos among the innovation team is not on my watch. I will gladly cannibalize my own product line because I will not be Kodak with the digital camera. And when I ask one of their innovators, what is your most favorite innovation? As I'll ask you in a minute, um, they said, he said, I was responsible for the glass associated with the flat panel television. And I remember the conversation of going to the board and saying, we have to knock it off with these cathode ray tubes. We have to stop that thinking and it's time to go flat, even though this is 90% of our business. I'm willing to stake our future on the flat panel rather than the, the television that comes with furniture around it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. living rooms what they are sure and that's, so, a, that's an amazing story that's a those are those risk takers i think you know and that's 30 years in the innovation team right of seeing that which fails and that which survives and saying i am willing to say our greatest money maker will be obsolete and we will not be fearful of it we will not let anyone outside take our revenue we will take our own revenue first thank you very much um, speaking of ovarian and testicular fortitude, that's, that's, that's up there. That, that's, <laughs> I, it's, it's like, I think that's when you talk about innovation theater, I, I think that's actually a really important thing to understand, which is, um, it's like a kid watching Rambo and then deciding they're going to enroll in the armed services, you know? And, and I think if you watch a Ted talk about how innovation works there, it might be really tempting to be one of those superheroes. And then you hear stories like that, where you have to go in front of the board and say, I, I'm going to be the guy that runs the risk of disrupting from within a company that's 129 years old or whatever. Um, that is so scary. 
it's like anyone who's actually been in combat is like, don't watch Rambo. Do not do what I do. <laughs> it is not for the, it's not something you, you would like. Um, and I think those real stories need to come out a lot more because it's really unsexy. It's very hard. And it's not something, it's a, it's a really unique personality type. And, and most people who think they're up for the challenge go through it and, and experience a really big mistake where there's, there's millions and sometimes hundreds of millions or billions of dollars that are lost because of it. And um, you have to live with that. It, it really f makes you focus on, on who you are. Um, I think, I think that's something that's kind of missing from the innovation conversation is, is there's enormous value in being a survivor, but we often only hear the stories of the superheroes. Mm. It's a really um, well, Greg, if you don't mind, I want to put you on the hot seat for a second. So if, if you were to fill in the blank for me, um, innovation is, what would you say? Innovation is... A unique combination of vision and audacity. Nice. So what is your favorite innovation that you've ever worked on? Oh, I know the one. Um, it was a, a thing I built for Google that if you were searching on a Google Chrome browser at night for shoes, it would pass the cookie into your Google map. And then the following day, as you were driving past a retail outlet that sold those shoes, it would send a push notification that there is a 20 minute express sale for those shoes inside of this like shoe store. And wow. it's sort of a way to bridge the divide between um, brick and mortar retail and e-commerce. Um, it never, it never really materialized at scale, but as far as like, there's such ethics behind it because we were going to sell that to really struggling small mom and pop brick and mortar retailers at a very reasonable price point. And um, I think that could have just been a killer. So that's another one that died on the vine, but I still am extremely proud of that. As far as innovations go, um, I built stuff with like the blockchain and AI and all of the sexy technology. And that was so simple and elegant and beautiful. Yeah, I'm in just envisioning the car accidents that I would have caused with that technology and thinking about like, who is the crack dealer who invented the technology <laughs> that has taken my midnight, um, my midnight craving and turned it into a next day retail opportunity. Like that's, that's addiction technology at work. It kind of is. I am that crack dealer. <laughs> and what is your favorite innovation story? Is there like an innovator that you admire or a story of how someone really came to create something, build something, bring something to market that you love? Oh, there's tons. Um, I think one of my favorite stories right now, and I'm, I'm writing it for my next book from, it's called Pinstripe to Punk. Keep your eyes peeled. Um, you heard it here first. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's the story of Gary Hoberman, who is currently the CEO of Uncork, but he, um, it's a no code platform initially targeted at financial services. They just closed the, I might get, don't quote me on this. Well, do quote me on this, but I might be wrong. I believe it's the second largest series B in the, history of the United States. It was $136 million Series B. But he um, used to be the CIO of MetLife Insurance. And before that uh, was, I'm going to say the CIO of Citigroup. Again, maybe not his exact job title. Hmm. But I, I, I find it really wonderful how if version 1.0 of, of the disruption entrepreneur was like this Mark Zuckerberg type and, and like dropping out of college in a black hoodie, a little bit like reckless. Um, and, and I think the next generation of disruption 2.0 that's disrupting finance are people that 
worked on the inside who got to the upper echelons of that system and at the age of like 50 decided, you know what, I think I'm going to launch my first startup. So I, I, I love how counterintuitive it, it is. And I love that the area that they're being, they're, they're disrupting is um, investment banking, which is, is, is not an area that's well known by very many people. It's not something, it's not a direct to consumer play, but the, the upside of it is potentially like monumental. There's so much more money in that space than anywhere else. Um, so that, that story keeps calling me back and I'm, I'm writing a book about it right now. Yeah. And so, um, I'm guessing that as you get older, watching people do this in their fifties is much more intriguing than some 22 year old whippersnapper who's like, Oh yeah. Okay, great. You're already born filled with piss and vinegar. So like, why wouldn't you disrupt at 22, but to do it at 50, when you've reached a particular echelon, you've gotten to a particular comfort level and you're like, now I'm going to burn this down and start something new. Thanks very much. Um, or I'm going to just step aside, yeah. step to the left and try something new. That's cool. I think the insight, like I said before, I, I think the, the, the difference between a survivor entrepreneur and the difference of a, of a superhero entrepreneur, it's, it's really different. Someone who's, who's, starting because, who's starting something because of a lifetime. We often only see the ribbon cutting ceremony and how they got there and what they endured to get there and how many times they were set back in trying to get there. That's really what I want to hear. Um, and I think when you're dealing with the sort of pinstripe to punk trajectory, you're, you're, you have all of the understanding of how hard it is to thrive as an entrepreneur. And someone at that stage is like, you know what? I'm going to risk it all and start with a blank canvas because I know it can be better. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I was hearing recently that... Um, people are more interested in seeing not the 40 under 40 list, but the 70 over 70, you know, like the folks who are just like, screw it. I'm going to spend my, my next 30 years building something awesome. Or um, now that I've been a corporate reader, I want to talk about saving humanity, saving the planet, saving something that is not about saving my wallet and my portfolio. I want to know what the next level of my life looks like that is not tied to a dollar sign. I'm hearing a lot of shifts in that direction too, that one is innovating from within rather than from without. Um, oh, hopefully with lots of ROI. Yes. <laughs> the American denominator across all things is ROI. Amen. <laughs> um, innovation you're most excited to see in your lifetime. Like what would you love to see happen? Is it the mission to Mars? What do you, what do you really want to see? What innovation do you want to see? I would like to see investment banking be disrupted. And I'm going to tell you something else I'd like to see disrupted. Management consulting. I believe that is the most inefficient and disruptable business out there. What does that mean? How is it? When you say disrupted, what, what do you hope for it? Um, I would like to see two things. One is modularization, meaning if you are someone with a extreme degree of expertise in a particular industry, um, then you earn that. I don't want that person to go out of business as an advisor. However, all of the army of 25 year olds that currently will charge someone $700 million because they were de deployed by McKinsey to accompany that person with expertise in a particular domain doesn't need to be there. It is the huge, the PowerPoint decks that they deliver go straight into a file cabinet. Uh, and the most impactful thing they could leave behind is working software that works that solves a problem. Maybe it is a piece of software that was developed and customized for the client to solve their specific problem. Maybe it's the implementation of a multi-user, multi-product, multi, you know, an implementation of existing software. 
But the idea that you just have their insight in a PowerPoint deck and are willing to spend that kind of money for it, I don't think that's a viable business model and I don't think it should exist. And I'm gonna say something else, Susan Lindner, which is that um, I always say the, the ultimate litmus test of an in, in just industry that's gonna go, uh, that is about to be disrupted is the midnight test. Meaning if you walk around the office at McKinsey or Boston Consulting Group or Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley or JP Morgan, and it's midnight on a weeknight and you walk around the office, you're gonna see a lot of people working. And if you ask them a few basic questions, what are you working on? Can I see your screen right now? How much money do you make? What you will in there invariably see is a lot of people working in Excel charts, a lot of people working in PowerPoint decks, very few people writing code, and very few write people, most of them will be doing work that someone in their organization has already done, but they don't know that. They can't access the data, they can't access the analysis, they can't access the human being. Mm -hmm. And they are recreating it, and then they're gonna charge a cust the customer a gazillion dollars for the, the reason they're staying up till midnight. Over and over and over again. Over and over again in perpetuity. And I believe fundamentally that there are so many industries failing the midnight test. And uh, investment banking, really large cap commercial banking and management consulting are three of them. I, I feel like that's about to end and, and, and I feel like that disruption is way overdue. And I feel like entrepreneurs like Gary Hoberman are gonna do it. That's fantastic. Because I know having dated some of those folks in my 20s, I never saw anybody till one o'clock in the morning anyway. <laughs> so no one had a life. No one even had like a desire, like even making the money that they did, there was no opportunity to spend it. <laughs> you could when they did spend it, they spent some of it on you, Susan. Oh, that's nice. That's <laughs> nice. I think we might have gone Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, it was such a pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much. How can people reach you, Greg? And when is the book coming out? The book is coming out when I finish it. So I'm going to put a uh, sometime in 2022. Got you. Uh, they should go to my website. This is greglarkin.com. That's the best way for people to reach out to me. They can also hit me up on LinkedIn. That's where I do most of my social stuff and um yeah those, those are those are the two things um, i'm speaking at a few events uh i'm speaking at inside outside innovation really soon and like they can go to this is greg and they should sign up for my newsletter um i put out a newsletter every two weeks uh where i go really inside the disruption diaspora and all of the new startups and new mega trends that are blowing up so they should Fantastic. sign up for that. And if you and if you want to see some really irreverent blog posts on LinkedIn, following Greg is the way to do that because you will get an earful just like this podcast of what is and is not working in innovation and disruption. So Greg, thank you so much. Thank you, Susan Lindner. It's always a pleasure. It is never a chore, and you are a delightful <laughs> human being. Back at you, sir. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks. This innovation story has ended, but yours is just beginning. Go to innovationstorytellers.com, download the free innovation storytelling blueprint, and sign up to pre-order Susan's book, Innovation Storytelling. Get the resources, runway, and recognition you deserve due out this spring. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Until the next innovation story.